I remember the day I left my hometown so clearly. It was a cool, crisp autumn morning, with the scent of fallen leaves filling the air. I loaded everything I held dear into my old pickup truck, determined to start over and escape the weight of my past. Leaving wasn't easy, but it was the only way to move forward. Betrayal and lies had shattered my world, and the only way to heal was to get as far away as possible from the ones who caused me so much pain. After hours on the road, I stumbled upon a quiet, little town that seemed like the perfect place to start over. The people were warm, the pace was slow, and the town had a quaint charm that drew me in. I came across an old, run-down gas station and garage that had been sitting unsold for years. Seeing the potential, I made a bold, low offer. And to my surprise, it was accepted. That rundown property became the cornerstone for rebuilding both my life and my business. One quiet Saturday afternoon, I sat in my favorite tavern, soaking in the calm. This place had quickly become my safe haven after moving here. I'd bought the town's gas station and repair shop at a steal, recognizing the hidden potential it held. The previous owner had been desperate to sell after it lingered on the market for too long years. It felt like the perfect place to start fresh and finally escape my troubled past. The first thing I did was build a large retail store facing the gas station to cater to the town's needs after the only grocery store closed at 7 p.m. I moved the gas tanks so the pumps were clearly visible from the store, leaving plenty of space for customer parking. The store was always busiest between 7 p.m. and midnight, but it stayed open 24-7. Meanwhile, the garage at the back ran from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., five days a week, with Saturdays reserved for special projects. At first, the bar wasn't too happy when we started selling basic liquor, but over time, it turned into a solid income stream and brought much-needed jobs to the community. The business really took off after I revamped the store's merchandising. A woman I hired had a sharp eye for this, and thanks to her, we quickly paid off the equity loan and had to double the staff to keep up with the rising demand. On Friday and Saturday nights, bargoers bought piles of junk food, and on Sundays we sold cold beer at unbeatable prices. That afternoon, I was sipping a double shot of Jack Daniels with ice water and a slice of lemon. I had just wrapped up a long project, replacing the steering column in an old family truck. It had taken me eight months to track down the part and customize some fixtures. The truck had been in the family since the 40s, and the owner had no plans of letting it go. If he had his way, he'd probably want to be buried in it. For to seven was the sweet spot at the bar, as most regulars had already finished dinner. In just a couple of hours, the place would be buzzing with a lively, musical crowd. Farmers brought their daughters for some after-work fun, and over the past six and a half years, I'd built a solid reputation and made a lot of friends. People here always watched out for each other, and they'd let me know if something out of the ordinary was happening. Every Saturday, I came to the bar for a drink before heading home. It was my moment of peace, a time to gather my thoughts. But then I saw them walk in, and I instantly wished I hadn't. They shattered what had been a perfect day. The woman was my ex's twin sister, and the young man with her was once my son. Seeing them dragged up memories I didn't want to relive. It made me realize how blind you can be when you live with evil. The boy had grown up, and now he looked more like his biological father. Proof that the truth always finds its way out. Why were they looking for me now? They chatted with the bartender, showed him a picture, then left. I was relieved by my long, scruffy hair, beard, and mustache. Along with the weight I'd lost, it made me look almost unrecognizable. No one noticed the simple message I sent, come home when you can. About half an hour later, the bartender, Tom, came over and sat down at my table. What did they want, Tom? I asked. They had a message for you. They heard a rumor you might be living here and came to see for themselves, Tom said. They said a woman named Willa is dying of cancer and wants to make peace. I played dumb, asked for a picture, and acted like I didn't know your name. Who are they, and what do they want? I pulled out a cigarette, ripped off the filter, and lit it. The woman's my ex-wife's twin sister. The young man is my ex-wife's illegitimate son. The one she pretended was mine for years. Based on your gut, do you think they were telling the truth? I asked. 
From their body language, I'd say they're partly honest, but they're definitely hiding something big, Tom replied. I nodded. My ex-wife and her sister had always been experts at deception, acting sincere while stabbing me in the back. Tom went back to the bar, leaving me to my thoughts. My mind wandered to almost seven years ago, the day I left, vowing not to return for another seven years. They laughed at me, assuming I was a fool, but they learned a hard lesson that day. From that moment on, they never saw or heard from me directly again. They didn't understand how serious or deeply wounded I was. To them, it was just a joke that had upset me. What they didn't know was that a few weeks before, I discovered that our youngest child wasn't mine. He was my brother-in-law's son. That bombshell set me on the path that led me here. A family member who had seen Willa and Tammy, the so-called evil twins, betray me countless times, was the one who gave me the proof. She referred to them as black witches, saying they practiced pure evil. Earlier that week, just before I left, we discovered a new life insurance policy taken out on me. It had double indemnity for accidental death, meaning $4 million if I died. A wise old woman advised me to get out, fast. When I went to grab my work truck, they had no idea it was already packed with everything I cared about from my 16-year marriage. I drove away without a second glance and ended up two states over. Some of this mess was my fault. I got Willa pregnant when she was 16 and I was 18. My family pushed me into marrying her, and before long we had two more kids. To them, the whole thing was a joke. Willa even told our daughters, Your father will come back when he cools off. He just needs to find his sense of humor again. A few hours later, a sheriff's car pulled up to the house. Willa greeted him at the door. Are you Mrs. Willa Ryan? He asked. When she said yes, he handed her an envelope and said, Ma'am, you've just been served. She laughed, thinking it was some kind of joke. But when she opened the envelope, the reality hit her. I had dissolved our marriage without a second thought. The grand dame told me Willa was stunned. My attorney had laid out everything our assets, liabilities, and even a DNA report proving her year-long affair. The divorce petition was packed with details, receipts, photos from their hotel meetings, and more. Inside the envelope was also a letter announcing that I was suing her husband for child support, infidelity, and defamation. Their laughter quickly faded. The joke wasn't on me anymore. I had the last laugh. For years, their joke was that I was only good for making money. Everything I touched turned to gold, so Willa and the kids were spoiled and never had to go without. But later, Willa discovered I'd sold off three of our businesses, paid off every debt, and sold our two apartment buildings for a hefty profit. I canceled all credit cards, pulled my name from the bank accounts, and signed over my half of the house to her. I took half our net worth in cash, slashing our monthly income from $10,000 to zero. Willa's sister quickly learned the true cost of using me. My attorney froze their assets before they ever got the subpoena, leaving them completely broke. After the divorce, my lawyer called Willa in and handed her a check, reimbursing her for a quarter of the losses. Why would he do that? She asked, confused. My lawyer calmly responded. For him, it was never about the money. It was about the principle. He hopes this gives you a chance to start over and maybe learn from the experience. Willa refused to finalize the divorce without talking to me, leaving us stuck in a legal separation. But I had no interest in speaking with someone who'd lied to me for years. She was forced to work for the first time in her life, quickly learning how fast money vanishes without a steady income. I had my attorney forward any important mail to a rented FedEx mailbox, which was then sent to my work address weekly. I knew full well that Willa and her sister thrived on manipulation and would eventually seek revenge. It wasn't a matter of if they'd come for me. It was only a matter of when. Their family didn't know how to let things go, and my absence would surely provoke them. The longer this dragged on, the nastier their retaliation would be. They'd never let me walk away without payback. Until now, I thought I'd managed to escape them for good. But seeing Tammy in town was a clear sign their game wasn't over. I downed the rest of my drink and slipped out the back door, in case they were watching the front. I crossed the empty lot behind the bar and looped around the block to reach my pickup. As I was unlocking the door, 
a man walked up to me and said, You're a hard man to find, Mr. Arthur. Sethra Sim, I presume? I replied, How do you know that? My name is Peter Edwards. Your oldest daughter, Connie, is my wife. He said, That could be a blessing or a curse. I said, Depending on how much she takes after her mother. So, why are you here? I came looking for you, Peter explained. There are some things that need to be settled. That might be easier if your mother-in-law would just sign the divorce agreement. I said. Peter looked shocked. What divorce agreement? He asked. I told Peter to follow me. We drove through town, then down a long driveway to a farmhouse. Inside my home office, I showed him the divorce papers and let him make copies. He didn't need to know that I didn't actually live there. I'd built the place for the grand dame, hoping she'd eventually leave her old home. Peter seemed like a pleasant, confident, and educated young man. But I couldn't help wondering, was he really who he claimed to be? Or was he just another pawn in Willa and Tammy's scheme? He used my Wi-Fi to download files to his laptop. All of my important records were stored there, with a master copy kept safe in a deposit box. He seemed especially interested in a copy of the sheriff's report Willa signed when she was served with the summons. He even managed to print a revealing letter from Willa's attorney to mine, acknowledging the agreed division of property but refusing to finalize the divorce unless I met with her in person. As Peter worked, I studied his expressions. It was clear he was learning a lot of new information. My paperwork contradicted what he'd been told. Do you think Connie knows the truth? Peter asked. That's for you to figure out, I replied. But here's a question for you. Is Willa really dying of cancer? Peter looked surprised. Who told you that? He asked. Tammy and Seth told the bartender that today. But I know Willa's just fine, I said. She's in a common law marriage with her former lawyer and expecting his second child. Peter sighed. Willa's the one who asked me to find you, to push the divorce through. She claims it's necessary so she can remarry. Peter called his wife and put her on speakerphone. Connie. Did you know your mother lied about the divorce not being finalized? Peter asked. What are you talking about? Connie sounded confused. Mom told us Dad abandoned us and cleaned out everything before he skipped town. If it weren't for our stepdad, we wouldn't have survived. I'm sending you the legal file, Peter said. Read it and get back to me as soon as you can. While they talked, I grabbed two bottles of Bud, opened them and set one in front of Peter. Why didn't you tell my daughter you found me? I asked. Connie and I have only been married for two years, and we just had a son three months ago, Peter said. For now, I'm not planning to tell anyone I found you. He then showed me his badge, confirming he was a police officer with the Paradise Police Department. I quickly checked the department's webpage on my laptop, and sure enough, he was telling the truth. It was an accident report from a few months back that led me to you. Peter explained. Connie filed a missing person report about your disappearance, and it got forwarded to the wanted list. The insurance company then informed me of the ruling in your favor. So why didn't you tell Connie you found me? I asked again. Peter hesitated. After reviewing your file, it became clear there's more going on here. I started wondering what happened to the $250,000 Willa was supposed to receive, along with the house deed. And why is everyone lying about what really happened? Yeah, sounds like I've been fed a lot of lies too, I replied, just as his phone rang. It's my wife. I'll put it on speaker, Peter said. Keep your voice low. Hi, honey, Connie said. Where did you get all this from? Is it true we've been lied to for years? Seth doesn't know his origins, and neither do I. My sister Karen's gonna be shocked. Mom stopped talking to her after she defended Dad. This contradicts everything we've been told. Mom and Aunt Tammy made it sound like Dad abandoned us. But now I'm finding out the divorce wasn't even finalized because Mom refused to sign. What's really going on here? Peter glanced at me, waiting for a response as the weight of her words hung in the air. It's true, Peter confirmed. I got this information from your father's lawyer's widow. I had to go out of state to find her. Turns out, her husband kept duplicates of all his records. From what I found, your mom was served with divorce papers the same day your dad left. I scribbled a note for Peter, 
suggesting Connie talk to her great Aunt Josie, if she was still alive. Peter nodded in agreement. Pete, we need to find my father now, Connie urged. He deserves to be free from Mom and all her schemes, at least to finalize the divorce. What happened to the money Mom got? Why did she have to sell the house if it was already hers? The more I dig, the more I wonder what's really going on. And why was she planning to sue him for desertion the moment she tracked him down? Ask my sister to watch our son a bit longer, and please talk to Aunt Josie. Maybe she'll finally open up about all this, Peter replied. We have to keep this between us for now. There could be serious fraud involved. Why has your mother been slandering your father for so many years? I'll need to have a word with the district attorney. That $250,000 cash disappeared right after it reached your father's lawyer. Don't tell your sister yet. If the DA starts an investigation, it's better that no one else knows. I stood up to grab us some food, giving Peter a moment of privacy while he finished the call. When he was done, Peter asked, Why do you want Connie to talk to Aunt Josie? Josie was the one who gathered all the dirt on Willa and George's affair. I explained. She never married but she kept a close watch on the family like a mother. Raising her own daughter as a single mom changed her perspective on things. She believed that Willa and Tammy conspired together, using both George and me. But the end game, Still a mystery. And if that's true, what's their angle? Peter asked. Aunt Josie's granddaughter, Jod, has been trying to get her to move in with her. But Josie refuses. She says she's waiting for the truth to come out first. Jod visits her regularly with her two sons. Jod lives a pretty isolated life, I added. Dealing with Willa and Tammy takes a toll on everyone. They've spent their entire lives using people. It wasn't until Josie handed me all the evidence that I saw it for what it was. Peter studied me for a moment before asking, Do you want to know about your children before I leave? Not until I'm sure you are who you say you are, I said cautiously. This could be another piece of their twisted game. Also, look into the sudden death of my lawyer. Because if Will is planning to sue me, what makes her think she can win? Peter's face went pale as the weight of what kind of people he'd married hit him. We decided to trust each other enough to exchange phone numbers. And he promised to keep me updated. I walked him to the door, shook his hand, and said goodbye. After he left, I cleaned up, locked the apartment, and took the long way home to make sure no one was following me. The drive gave me time to think. My life had gotten so much better since I put the past behind me. Did I really want to open those old wounds again? Knowing Willa and Tammy, I needed to be ready for whatever was coming, because they'd stop at nothing for money. The moment I stepped inside, two little kids ran up and grabbed my legs. I scooped up my three- and four-year-olds, the lights of my life. They were just like their mother, and I felt incredibly lucky to have all three of them in my world. My wife, Jod, called out that dinner was almost ready, so I went to wash up. During dinner, I told her about my day. Since closing the store, I never imagined my life could be this good. When I left Paradise almost seven years ago, I promised my grandmother, Josie, that I'd keep in touch. And I did, calling her every Sunday without fail. A little over a year ago, Josie reached out for help. Her granddaughter, Jod, needed to escape a bad marriage and start over somewhere safe. Jod, ten years younger than me, didn't have any kids and was living on an army base out of state. I didn't know much about her, but I owed Josie and was more than willing to help. It took me about a week to find and partially furnish a two-bedroom apartment for her in a quiet town, which wasn't easy without a friend's help. When I arrived to pick up Jod, she had already quit her job emptied her bank accounts, and packed her bags. Her husband was set to enlist in the army after his final training exercise. I showed up quietly around 8 o'clock in the evening with a rented U-Haul. With the help of a few neighbors and friends, we loaded everything she wanted into the truck. In less than four hours, we were gone, and I refused to tell anyone where I was from. For her safety. As we drove back, Jod and I started to get to know each other better. Late that night, she got a call from her grandmother. I had to laugh when I overheard Jod say, Grandma, Art picked me up. You could have warned me he's a wild bushman who might look half-decent if he cleaned up. The next day, 
Josie contacted Jod's attorney to have all her legal documents sent to my FedEx box. Jod warned me that her soon-to-be ex-husband might try to cause trouble, so I took steps to protect her. Jod quickly took over managing my store and turned out to be an incredible manager. She made smart changes, always putting customer needs first, which brought in more business. Her warm personality drew in a whole new group of clients, and she organized the staff in a way that made everything run smoothly. Meanwhile, Josie had to get a restraining order against Jod's ex-husband because of his constant threats. He was dishonorably discharged and ended up moving back to my old hometown, mistakenly thinking Jod had gone there. To avoid unwanted attention, Jod started wearing a diamond ring, which helped her adjust to her new life. She took charge of the banking and bookkeeping, gaining everyone's trust since I had introduced her as part of the business. Her honesty and charm won people over, and with her long black hair usually pulled back, she always looked polished. When people asked about the ring, she'd just smile and say, I'm sure you'll figure it out, which led to some wild rumors that she was my future mail-order bride. Jod started bringing me lunch on Saturdays, knowing I often forgot to eat while working, which had led to me losing weight. Our relationship grew naturally, and soon enough, everyone assumed we were a couple. Josie kept us informed about events back home, and our curiosity spiked when we heard Jod's ex had gotten friendly with Tammy. The day Jod's divorce was finalized, our relationship deepened. We celebrated with friends at the local bar, sharing our first kiss during a slow dance under the dim lights. Six months later, we moved in together. One evening, while the kids were taking a bath, I decided to shave off my beard and mustache, leaving just a bit of stubble. The kids watched in awe. I lathered my face and theirs with the shaving brush and bowl Jod had bought me for Christmas, making them squeal with delight. Just as I was finishing up, Jod walked in, surprised to see the kids with soapy faces, laughing as I wiped mine clean. It looks like Daddy would look like you with a clean face, Jod teased, grinning. Should I cut his hair too? Both toddlers eagerly shouted, Yes. I chuckled and said, I think I'll leave that to the barber on Monday. No, I'll do it myself before you change your mind, Jod insisted. After drying off the kids and getting them ready for bed, they sat at the kitchen table, eagerly watching as Jod cut my hair. By the time she was done, I barely recognized myself in the mirror. You did a great job, I told her, genuinely impressed. She smiled and sent me off to shower the loose hair away while she tidied up. During all of this, Jod's grandmother called to let us know that Connie had just left. Jod believed her grandmother was finally ready to confront the family and set things straight. Connie had discovered that my three kids were supposed to be receiving $600 each month from annuities I'd set up for child support but they hadn't seen a single penny of it. The following week, I endured endless jokes about my new look. People kept asking Jod if she'd blackmailed me into joining normal society. Jod played along, joking that I had promised to bathe at least three times a week now. Most people got the joke, though some didn't. It was fascinating to watch how people acted when they thought they were somehow better than you. Then, out of nowhere, Bird of Paradise informed me I was being sued in civil court for child abandonment, desertion, and back child support. Jod and I couldn't help but find it amusing, knowing a judgment would only result in a collection service trying to track me down. Even the mailman found it funny when he broke the news. The situation got even more absurd when his boss and the district attorney decided to hire an attorney on my behalf, hoping to use my case to piece together the bigger picture. Peter estimated that Willa and Tammy had stolen over $48,000 from each of our children. They also reopened my former attorney's sudden death as a criminal case, with Jod's ex-husband becoming a person of interest. If everything was confirmed, Willa and Tammy were looking at seven to ten years in prison, and Willa's current common-law husband, who had once been her attorney, could be disbarred. The lawyer hired to represent me would be paid by them, and I needed to stay hidden to help strengthen the case. For a few weeks, we had peace. Then, on a Sunday night, Josie called, letting us know that the paperwork would be filed the next day. She emailed me everything she had gathered over the past seven years. There were notarized statements, videotaped conversations, and the names of attorneys for a countersuit. What caught my eye was a $2 million accident insurance policy, explaining some of the missing money. 
Jod discovered that it had been purchased just six months before I left. We spent half the night forwarding everything to the district attorney. Convinced this had all been part of a setup to lure me back. The pieces were finally coming together, and it looked like the truth was about to come out. The next morning, Jod contacted the recommended attorneys and chose one, sending them all the documents along with a retainer. We had a plan. Once Willa's team filed the lawsuit, I'd serve them first, before even receiving it. On Friday morning, Jod called me with news. Josie was on her way with some guests. They had left Thursday night, stayed at a hotel, and would arrive soon. That was a clear sign things were heating up. Jod and I decided to close the store on Saturday and enjoy a long weekend with family. Peter was driving in with Connie and their son. All Connie knew was that they were coming to visit Jod. Around 7 p.m., a Ford Explorer and an Escape pulled into the driveway. Four adults stepped out of the cars. Jod noticed my concern and squeezed my hand. My truck was hidden in the garage so no one knew I was there. Who's with Josie? Jod asked. That's Peter, his wife Connie holding their baby, and Karen, my second oldest. I said, are you ready for this? She asked. As ready as I'll ever be, I replied. Jod, holding our youngest, opened the front door, and we all stepped out to greet them. The moment Karen saw me, she burst into tears. I handed my son to his great-grandmother and hugged Karen tightly. Connie passed her son to Peter and joined us. Seeing my daughters, now grown into beautiful women, standing together was an emotional moment I'd never forget. Good to see you again, Peter. I said, shaking his hand firmly. After introductions, Jod served a huge dinner. Beef shoulder, mashed potatoes with gravy, scones, Yorkshire pudding, string beans, and hot apple pie for dessert. Once the kids were settled, we gathered around to finally discuss everything. First of all, Art, is it okay if I call you Dad? Peter asked. I nodded. Then, Dad. The DA suspects Jod's ex's car was involved in your lawyer's accident. We're doing a paint comparison with the current owner's vehicle. If it matches, he'll be charged with manslaughter, Peter explained. The fire that destroyed your lawyer's office the same night is now being treated as arson. He was spotted in the background on surveillance footage. Since Willa and her attorneys sealed the divorce papers, they think there's no evidence left of what really happened. They just filed a lawsuit against you this week. Jod turned to me, and tears welled up in her eyes. I used to think you were being overprotective when you moved me here, but now I see you weren't. I thought your questions to my grandmother were too much, but now I get it. You had to know who we were up against before making a plan. Willa and Tammy received your countersuit on Thursday, Josie chimed in. They must have realized I was in contact with you. We worried they'd start coming after me. So we left in a hurry. Grandma, we've got your new house all ready, Jod said. Everything's set. You just need to bring your clothes. I brought most of it in the car, Josie replied. Connie's going to ship the rest, including my antiques. I gave her power of attorney to sell the house and furniture. It was time to leave paradise behind. The relief on Josie's face was unmistakable, and I realized just how much she had sacrificed to keep us all safe. I'll drive back with Peter and Connie and rent a truck to haul everything out. I said, it's time to find out if our suspicions are correct. What suspicions? Peter asked. The lawsuit against me is just a trap to lure me out. I explained. With $2 million in accidental death insurance, it's obvious my former attorney's accident was a test run. Peter, Connie, Karen, and Josie all went pale as the full weight of the truth sank in. They were planning your death, Dad, Connie said quietly. You knew it before you left town. I had a pretty good idea, I said, giving a small smile. Even my lawyer didn't believe me at first, but he learned the hard way that I was right. Their shocked expressions said it all. The pieces of the puzzle were finally falling into place. Peter excused himself to make some important calls, giving my daughters, Jod, and me time to catch up. Jod found old pictures of me from when we first met, and both my daughters admitted they wouldn't have recognized me now. When Peter returned, the room fell silent. Willa will be taken into custody after the holiday, Peter said. 
We can hold her for 48 hours before charging her with three counts of theft for stealing from the children's annuities. We're going to slow the process down so she won't get a bond hearing right away, he explained. Dad, if you can fly in on Wednesday, rent a U-Haul, and visit some old places to get noticed, just tell anyone who asks that you're there to pack up Josie's things. This way, Willow will have to communicate from jail. The DA confirmed your suspicions were spot on. We'll have police protection for you at Josie's house until this all gets resolved. Jod turned to Peter with concern. Peter, are you using my kid's father as bait to lure out my cousins? How can I be sure he won't end up getting hurt? I looked at Jod, and she immediately saw the resolve in my eyes. Damn, you're going to do it, no matter what I think, she said with a sigh. Jod knew me better than I knew myself. Jod, art's always been like that. Josie chimed in. That's why I called him to save you from your ex. He never asks anyone to do what he wouldn't do himself. He's determined to get rid of those witches for good. My only fear is Art putting himself in danger again, Jod said, smiling despite her worry. If Art were a boxer, he'd be a world champion, Josie said. He's quick on his feet and outsmarts them every time. Willa and Tammy have no clue that he's on to them. Ladies, relax. I'll be in Peter's hands. I assured them. And if anything happens to me, remember, he'll have to answer to Connie, my daughter. Peter just nodded, fully aware of the risks involved with my return to paradise. Later, while the women were deep in conversation, Peter and I talked privately. The DA thinks Jod's ex will make his move as soon as he hears you're back in town, Peter said. He'll be furious once he realizes you're the one who rescued Jod from her awful marriage. Willa will hear about your return through a planted informant in the city jail by early Thursday morning. If he's caught in the act, do you think he'll spill everything to save himself? I asked. Given his military background, he's always confessed when cornered. He's more of a follower than a leader, so I expect him to fold quickly. Willa and Tammy manipulate him easily which is why he sticks with them, Peter explained. As we drove into town, the sign read, Welcome to the City of Refuge, population 34,848. It reminded me how the city council had essentially declared that the laws of the United States didn't apply here. It was like the Wild West. Justice was whatever the local authorities decided it to be. Law-abiding citizens were prosecuted while illegal activities were ignored all to satisfy those in power who wanted lower wages and cheaper labor. Plenty had been done to create that opportunity, forcing those in charge to turn a blind eye. Almost seven years had passed, and not much had changed, except for the freshly paved main street. Everything else looked frozen in time. I decided my first stop would be my old favorite place, if it still existed. To my relief, Bob and Betty's Burger Bar was still there, looking exactly the same, just with a fresh coat of paint. I pulled into the parking lot, stepped out of the U-Haul, and headed for the entrance around 11.15, just before the weekday lunch crowd. I was counting on being recognized. After all, I used to be a well-known businessman here. We wanted people to know I was back. As I sat down and picked up the menu, I noticed several people staring and discreetly using their cell phones. The server brought over my coffee and creamer, then asked if I was ready to order. Is today's special meatloaf, baked beans, and garlic mashed potatoes still available? I asked. How do you know about that? The server replied, surprised. It's for regulars only, not advertised. Tell Jack that Art wants brown gravy and fried onions with the meatloaf, I said with a smile. She looked at me like I was out of my mind. I stood up and said, Never mind, I'll tell him myself. I pushed through the swinging kitchen doors with the server trailing behind, shouting my order. Jack turned around, spotted me, and grinned. You dumbass, Jack said, smirking. You're a few weeks early. Welcome back, old friend. Susan, bring Art's coffee in here, Jack called out. Let's catch up while he eats. Jack, the son of the original owner, had never changed the place's name. We'd been friends most of our lives. We sat and talked until just before the lunch rush. At one point, Jack sent someone to fetch his wife, giving us some time to get into the important stuff. Art, you should know something, 
Jack said, lowering his voice. After you left, my wife ended her friendship with Willa and Tammy for good. She couldn't stand the way they talked about you and the kids. She didn't like what they did, either. Hearing that, I knew things had changed more than I thought. Jack, a few things are about to unfold. I began. Last night, an arrest was supposed to happen. If it goes as planned, it'll set off a chain reaction, like a row of dominoes. Connie's husband, Peter, is in on it. That's why I came back early. Jack's expression grew serious. Peter's a damn good cop and an honest man. He put two of our former city council members in jail last year for corruption. You'll have to tell me more later. Too many big ears around here. Just then, we spotted Sasha pulling into the parking lot. She looked great. I sat back down, waiting for her to come in, knowing she'd spot me from behind and wouldn't suspect anything was amiss. What's going on, Jack? Susan asked. It's important, Sasha said, her eyes widening when she finally saw me. I stood up and turned to face her. Sasha, my little sister, looked like she was about to lose her temper, but then she saw me clearly. Her older, tougher brother was back. I hugged her tightly, as if no time had passed. It took her a few minutes to calm down, and Jack asked the kitchen staff to give us some privacy. Do mom and dad know you're back? Sasha asked. No, and it's best to keep it quiet for a few days, I replied. Are you here because Willa was taken into custody last night? She asked. Yes, and it's going to get worse before it gets better, I said. Once I settle in, I'll be under police protection. The authorities are reopening my former lawyer's death. They now think it's linked to the arson at his office. Jack and Sasha exchanged glances, their faces saying it all. It was no secret the new DA, appointed three years ago, was determined to solve a slew of unsolved cases. You're the bait, aren't you? Jack said quietly. If things play out right, the arson, the liquidation, and several other crimes will be solved in the coming days. I said. Everything has been orchestrated to force me back into the city. Willa's arrest and my sudden return will throw a wrench in their plans. What's behind all this? Jack asked, leaning in. A $2 million insurance policy with double indemnity on accidental death. I said, it's on me. Hmm. My sister muttered as we walked out of the restaurant toward my rental truck. We were chatting when we noticed Tammy pulling up beside us. Where are you staying? Sasha whispered. At the Grand Dame's house. I'm moving her things to the new place. I said, she wanted to be far away from whatever's about to go down. Josie left town? Sasha asked, surprised. She wanted to be near her granddaughter. And our two boys? I said with a smile. Jod and I have been together for over five years now. Our sons just turned three and four. Sasha's face showed pure shock. You and Jod? How did that happen? Josie and I kept in touch the whole time, I explained. When Jod needed help getting out of her failed marriage, her grandmother called me. I moved her to my place. We believe her ex had a hand in my lawyer's death and the fire that destroyed his office. Do Tammy and Willa know that you're aware of all this? Sasha asked, her voice low. No, but they'll figure it out soon enough once they start making their moves. I replied calmly. Tammy approached us, looking tense. Art, I need you to drop part of your lawsuit against us, she said. The district attorney's about to charge Willa within 48 hours. Unfortunately, my lawyer says that's not possible, I replied. Willa just filed a new divorce petition, claiming desertion, abandonment of the child, and back child support. Until the court rules on those claims, everything has to stay as it is. Tammy's face tightened, realizing the mess they were in. You can't say that. How are we supposed to bail her out with no assets? Tammy asked, her frustration evident. You have a court order freezing everything. Maybe your father could help by putting up his house as collateral. I suggested, keeping my tone neutral. After all, you're both his daughters. Tammy frowned, turned away, and walked off, clearly disappointed. Willa and Tammy's father wants nothing to do with them, Sasha said quietly. Not since he found out about Seth's true parentage. He says they turned out just as bad as their mother. That brought a small smile to my face. 
With that conversation behind us, I climbed into the U-Haul and drove toward Josie's house, making a quick stop to pick up packing supplies. About three hours later, I was backing the truck into her driveway. Using the side mirrors, I parked as close to the garage as possible. Before going inside, I checked to make sure everything was as Josie had left it. She mentioned leaving the curtains open, but now they were closed. I texted Peter, asking if he or his team had done it. He replied that some officers who had been in the house might have closed them for safety. Satisfied, I unlocked the front door and stepped inside. Mr. Ryan, an officer said, handing me a cell phone. Peter Edwards wants to speak with you. Hey, Peter, I greeted him. Looks like the people who needed to know are in the loop, Peter said. Tammy tracked me down at the burger place after I wrapped up my long lunch. She tried to get me to lift the lien on Willa's assets, but I told her no. I heard that, Peter continued. We recorded Willa and Tammy discussing their plans. Jod's ex, Brad Press, came up a lot. Willa told Tammy to let him know you know where Jod is, thinking that would push him to act. Our hunch was right. Brad showed up not even an hour later. Willa gave him your location. Our informant, who we arrested today, told her you were back to move Josie. Peter added, when Brad asked where you were staying, Willa told him it was at Jod's place. A few minutes later, I saw the garage door open. I got into the van, pulled out bundles of cardboard boxes, and started packing up the house. Around 6.30 p.m., the pizza I'd ordered from Papa John's arrived. The delivery guy knocked, and when I opened the door, he asked, Are you moving? I said, No, just helping a friend. Brad made his move around 11 p.m. Using a tire iron, he picked the front door lock and slipped inside. Spotting a light in the kitchen, he quietly made his way there, pulling a 9 mm pistol from under his shirt. But when he got there, he found me sitting calmly, drinking coffee. Hey, Art, Brad said, his voice cold. Willa and Tammy say hi. I'm here to find out where Jod is so I can visit her. Sorry, but I'd never tell my lawyer's killer or the man who burned down his office. I replied, setting my coffee down. But before you kill me, and we both know you will, how much were you promised from the insurance settlement? What makes you think I did it? He asked, taking the bait. Because you seem like the type they'd manipulate into doing their dirty work. So. How much of the four million dollars from the accidental death policy did they offer you? Four million? Brad's eyes widened. They told me it was only seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I laughed and said, Did you know Seth is actually the son of Tammy's first husband? Brad's face turned white. George and I have been manipulated by both twins for years. I continued. My attorney, working on my divorce, sued George and Tammy for everything they had. Brad's face grew even paler. That's why I knew Willa suing me for desertion and back child support was a scam, I said. The divorce was already finalized and just needed her signature. She tricked me into coming back, and that's when I figured it all out. You're just another pawn in their game. So ask yourself, what do you think they've got planned for you? My divorce only delayed their scheme to eliminate me. You killing my lawyer? That set their original plan back in motion. You have a chance to stop them. Knowing what we know about them, what does your gut tell you? It's hard to watch someone realize they've been used and discarded once they're no longer needed. I'm screwed either way, Brad muttered, shaking his head. The fact that my lawyer lost control of his car and hit a tree at 70 miles per hour makes it manslaughter. That could land me in prison for life. You could get 5 to 10 for manslaughter, but murder is life. And once I'm dead, they can claim you acted out of rage over Jod and didn't know what you were doing. Think about it. Did they set you up to be the scapegoat? Most accidental death policies don't cover murder. If you were in my shoes, what would you do? I asked, watching as Brad grappled with the truth. You'd make a deal, turn in state's evidence, and hope your cooperation buys you some leniency. That way, you'd get revenge on those plotting to take you out. I said calmly. Brad hesitated then placed the gun on the table. Call the police. I nodded and said, Brad, turn around. They're already standing right behind you. Meanwhile, Connie watched her husband on the phone, 
sensing something was up. Peter had told her that her father was at Josie's. A late-night call had woken them both. While he talked, she put the kettle on for hot chocolate. When Peter hung up, he was smiling. Your dad surprised everyone tonight, Peter said. He talked Brad out of it and got him to confess everything. The undercover officers recorded the whole thing. Connie froze, astonished. How did my dad pull that off? He told Brad some things he didn't know, like the truth about Seth's origins, Peter explained. I think your father convinced Brad that the insurance policy wouldn't pay out for murder. That was the tipping point. Even I'm not sure if that's true, but it planted enough doubt in Brad's mind for him to take a lesser charge over life without parole. Your Aunt Josie always said your dad was quick on his feet, but this was something else. What does this mean for my mom and Tammy? Connie asked. If Brad agrees to testify against them in court, they'll be charged with arson, manslaughter, and at least the attempted murder of your dad, Peter said. Connie immediately picked up her phone and called Jod. She let her know everything was in motion and that Josie would watch the kids for a few days. Jod was heading to the airport, and Connie would meet her once she got a text with the arrival time. After hanging up, she explained everything to her sister. By then, Peter had gotten dressed and was heading to the station to secure Brad's signed statement before the night ended. I didn't wake up until 8 a.m. The first thing I did was call Jack to get the front door fixed. He said he knew a guy, and within half an hour, someone was there. The door was replaced, and new trim and locks were installed. The repairman was just finishing when my daughter Connie pulled up with Jod. As soon as Jod got out of the car, she ran to me, tears streaming down her face. In that moment, I realized just how much she'd been through. Brad was taken into custody last night, I said. He surrendered to the police. I was never in any real danger. If that's true, why didn't you call me? Jod asked, her voice shaky. Why did I have to hear about it from Connie? It was almost 2 a.m. by the time the police cleared out, I admitted. I thought I'd call you in the morning. I pulled my wife close, wrapping my arm around her. I promise, I'll never put myself in that kind of danger again. Once the repairman finished, we locked up the car, put her luggage away, and headed to my brother's restaurant for breakfast. When we arrived, we were greeted by Karen, Sasha, and my parents. Jack's staff had to push two tables together just so we could all sit down. Everyone gave Jod a warm welcome. The breakfast, when it arrived, was fantastic. Jack was so excited about everything that had happened, and we devoured every bite. My parents were overjoyed to learn that Jod and I had two sons named Carson and Hunter, after my grandfathers. They spent the meal scrolling through the photos of our boys and us that Jod had saved on her phone. My daughters opened up to my parents, telling them about discovering me with Josie. We were still chatting when Peter joined us, looking tired. Willa and Tammy are in custody, Peter said. Brad confessed to everything, including his initial plan to kill his father. He's going to be charged with arson and manslaughter when he testifies in the witch trials. Tammy and Willa face three counts of grand larceny, two counts of conspiracy to commit murder and fraud. The DA is also meeting with the divorce judge who handled your case to expedite finalizing it. Jod's eyes widened as she tried to process the news. Peter, are you saying Art and I can finally get married? The DA submitted all the paperwork to the judge, Peter explained, including Dad's original divorce documents. The DA hopes the judge, being fully informed, will waive Willa's signature, skip the waiting period, and issue the divorce certificate. I turned to Jod, smiling. Well, Jody, I think it's time I buy you a proper engagement ring and finally propose. Everyone murmured at my remark, and Jod's eyes filled with tears. She had always believed we would get married, but hearing it now took her by surprise. Before we left, my parents made us promise to come over for dinner that evening. Jod and I spent the afternoon packing until about 5.30, then headed to my parents' house. Over dinner, they had plenty of questions, eager to learn more about Jod. She shared how I had rescued her from a failed marriage, thanks to her grandmother's intervention. Then, she talked about getting her first job and how it led her to where she was today. The warmth of family surrounded us, and for the first time in years, 
it felt like everything was falling into place. We were still enjoying each other's company when Peter and Connie arrived with my finalized divorce certificate. Felt good to know I was finally free. During a lull in the conversation, Jod took the opportunity to brag about our children and our life together. My mom suggested we should have a wedding before heading back, which got everyone excited. That's when my father pulled Peter aside. Grabbing a beer each, we followed him into the den, where we could actually talk. Calls had been pouring in ever since word got out about Tammy's arrest. Half the DA staff was scrambling to process the new information. What we thought we knew was just the tip of the iceberg. Tammy and Willa's schemes ran much deeper. Now it looked like the mayor might go down with them. And what about Willa's common-law husband? I asked curious. How involved was he in all of this? He'll likely be disbarred, but as far as we can tell, he's not tied to any of their criminal activity, Peter said. He'll probably stay involved with raising their kids, but that's about it. Has anyone let Aunt Josie know what's happening? Connie asked. Peter smirked. By the way, Jod wears a size six and a half ring, in case you were wondering. A few minutes later, Peter and I were on our way to the mall. Peter bought a gift for Connie, and I picked out a beautiful three-ring engagement set, knowing Jod's taste. When we returned, we were pleased to find that no one had even realized we were gone. I was on the phone with Josie when Karen and her boyfriend arrived. The house was buzzing with activity, so we all moved into the living room, and the guys brought in chairs from the kitchen to fit everyone. The house was full of life and love, and it felt like the beginning of a new chapter. Dad told Jod to sit in his chair, which immediately caught my mom's attention. She watched the scene unfold with eagle eyes, sensing something was up. The room fell silent as I walked over, knelt down, and asked my common-law wife to officially become my wife. I caught her completely off guard, but Jod smiled through her surprise and said yes. The celebration kicked into high gear after that. My dad proudly raised his glass and said, I need to catch up on almost seven years of drinking with my son. And Jod and Art, your engagement is the perfect excuse to start. Peter had to drive Jod and me back to Josie's house. A lot of stress and worry had been lifted from our shoulders. On Friday, we went to City Hall to pick up our marriage license. Jod found out she could fit perfectly into Connie's wedding dress. Jack agreed to be my best man, and Karen stepped in as Jod's maid of honor. The DA even offered to perform the ceremony. I had to buy a suit at Macy's. There was no way my future wife would let me marry her in blue jeans. That Sunday afternoon, in my parents' backyard, with our entire family present, we exchanged vows to everyone's joy. Even the twins' father attended. Though we asked for no gifts, my former father-in-law handed me an envelope. Colin, this isn't a wedding gift. It's your early inheritance he said with a smile. The rest of my estate will go to your daughters. I tucked the envelope into my suit pocket and didn't think about it again for the rest of the day. The ceremony was videotaped and sent to Aunt Josie. When someone asked where we were going for our honeymoon, Jod smiled and said, After everything we've been through, once Grandma's settled in her new house, our honeymoon will be a week in Florida and a week in California, enjoying Disney with the kids, because without family, we wouldn't be where we are today. Before we headed home the next day, I handed Jod an envelope. Inside was a bank promissory note for $100,000 along with a note that read, Thank you for helping to fix karma. I always believed the twins had a hand in their mother's death. Now, I'll enjoy watching them get what they deserve, and so will my granddaughters. Jod quietly tucked the envelope into her purse, not saying a word to anyone. After sharing heartfelt hugs with my daughters and parents, Jod and I climbed into the U-Haul. As we drove away, a sense of peace washed over us. We were finally free of the past.